in which an affair unfolds, and we see the damage wrought upon the scorned. Chapter 35 The prince imparted his cheerful state of mind to his household, to his acquaintances, and even to the German landlord with whom the Scherbatskys were staying. Having come back from the springs with Kitty, the prince, who had invited the colonel, Maria Evgenieva, and, the, and Varenka for coffee, ordered a table and chairs to be taken out to the garden under the chestnut tree, and had lunch served there. The landlord and servants revived under the influence of his cheerfulness. They knew his generosity, and a half hour later the sick doctor from Hansburg, who lived upstairs, was looking enviously out the window at this cheerful and healthy Russian company gathered under the chestnut tree. In the shade of the trembling circles of leaves, by the table covered with a white cloth, and set with coffee-pots, bread, butter, cheese and cold game, sat the princess in a fichu with lilac ribbons, handing out cups and tartines. At the other end sat the prince, eating heartily and talking loudly and cheerily. The prince laid his purchases out beside him. Carved boxes, knick-knacks, paper knives of all kinds, which he had bought in quantity at each watering place, and gave to everybody, including the maid Lishin and the landlord, with whom he joked in his comically bad German, assuring him that if it were not the waters that had cured Kitty, but his excellent food, especially the prune soup. The princess chuckled at her husband's Russian habits, but was more lively and cheerful than she had been during her entire stay at the spa. The colonel smiled, as always, at the prince's jokes, but with regard to Europe, which he had studied attentively, as he thought, he was on the princess's side. The good-natured Maria Evgenieva uh, rocked with laughter at everything amusing that the prince said, and Varenka, something Kitty had not seen before, melted into weak but infectious laughter, provoked in her by the prince's witticisms. All this cheered Kitty up, yet she could not help being preoccupied. She could not solve the problem her father had unwittingly posed for her by his merry view of her friends and the life she had come to like so much. To this problem was added the change in her relations with the Petrovs, which had shown itself so obviously and unpleasantly today. Everyone was merry, but Kitty was unable to be merry, and this pained her still more. She had the same feeling as in childhood, when she was punished by being locked in a room and heard her sister's merry laughter. "'Well, what did you buy such a mountain of things for?' said the princess, smiling and handing her husband a cup of coffee. "'You go for a walk, and you come to a shop, and they beg you to buy something. Erlocht, excellence, drklokt. Well, by the time they get to drklokt, I can't hold out. There go ten thalers. It's only out of boredom, said the princess. Certainly it's out of boredom. Such boredom, my dear, that you don't know what to do with yourself. How can you be bored, prince? There's so much that's interesting in Germany now, said Maria Evgenievna. But I know all the interesting things. I know prune soup. I know pea sausages. I know it all. 
No, like it or not, Prince, their institutions are interesting, said the colonel. What's so interesting? They're all pleased as punch. They've beaten everybody. Well, but what's there for me to be pleased about? I didn't beat anybody. I just have to take my boots off myself and put them outside the door myself. In the morning I get up, dress myself at once, go downstairs and drink vile tea. Home is quite another thing. You wake up without hurrying, get angry at something, grumble a little. Come properly to your senses, think things over, don't leave in a hurry. But time is money. You're forgetting that, said the colonel. Which time? There are times when you'd have given a whole month away for fifty kopecks, and others when you wouldn't give up half an hour for any price. Right, Katenka? Why are you so dull? I'm all right. Where are you going? Stay longer, he said to Varenka. I must go home said Varenka, getting up and again dissolving in laughter. Having recovered, she said good-bye and went into the house to get her hat. Kitty followed her. Even Varenka looked different to her now. She was not worse, but she was different from what she had formerly imagined her to be. Ah, I haven't laughed like that for a long time, said Varenka, collecting her parasol and bag. He's so nice, your father. Kitty was silent. "'When shall we see each other?' asked Varenka. "'Maman wanted to call on the Petrovs. "'You won't be there?' Kitty said, testing Varenka. "'I will,' replied Varenka. "'They're leaving, so I promised to come and help them pack.' "'Well, I'll come too.' "'No, why should you?' "'Why not? Why not? Why not?' Kitty said, opening her eyes wide and taking hold of Varenka's parasol to keep her from leaving. No, wait. Why not? It's just that your father has come, and then they're embarrassed with you. No. Tell me, why don't you want me to visit the Petrovs often? You don't want it, do you? Why? I didn't say that, Varenka said calmly. No, please tell me. Tell you everything? asked Varenka. Everything, everything, Kitty repeated. There's nothing special, only that Mikhail Alexievich, that was the painter's name, wanted to leave sooner, and now he doesn't want to leave at all, Varenka said, smiling. Well? Well? Kitty urged, giving Varenka a dark look. Well, and for some reason, Anna Pavlovna said he didn't want to leave because you are here. Of course it was inappropriate, but because of it, because of you, there was a quarrel. And you know how irritable these sick people are? Kitty, frowning still more, kept silent, and Varenka alone talked, trying to soothe and calm her, and seeing the explosion coming whether of tears or of words, she did not know. So it's better if you don't go, and you understand you won't be offended. Serves me right. Serves me right. Kitty began quickly, snatching the parasol out of Varenka's hands and looking past her friend's eyes. Varenka wanted to smile, seeing her friend's childish anger but she was afraid of insulting her. How does it serve you right? I don't understand, she said. It serves me right because it was all pretense, because it was all contrived and not from the heart. What did I have to do with some stranger? And it turned out that I caused a quarrel, and I did what nobody asked me to do, because it was all pretense, pretense, pretense. But what was the purpose of pretending? Varenka said softly. Oh, how vile and stupid. There was no need at all. It was all pretense, she said, opening and closing the parasol. But for what purpose? So as to seem better to people, to myself, to God, to deceive everyone. 
No, I won't fall into that anymore. Be bad, but at least don't be a liar, a deceiver. But who was a deceiver? Varenka said reproachfully. You talk as if... But Kitty was having her fit of temper. She did not let her finish. I'm not talking about you. Not about you at all. You are perfection. Yes, yes, I know you're perfection. But what's there to do if I'm bad? This wouldn't have happened if I weren't bad. So let me be as I am, but I won't pretend. What do I care about Anna Pavlovna? Let them live as they please, and me as I please. I can't be different. And all this is not it. Not it! What is not it? Varenka said in perplexity. It's all not it. I can only live by my heart. And you live by rules. I loved you simply, but you probably only so as to save me. To teach me. You're unfair, said Varenka. But I'm not talking about others. I'm talking about myself. Kitty, came her mother's voice. Come here. Show Papa your corals. Kitty, with a proud look, not having made peace with her friend, took the little box of corals from the table and went to her mother. What's the matter? Why are you so red? Her mother and father said in one voice. Nothing, she replied. I'll come straight back. And she ran inside again. She's still here, she thought. What shall I tell her? My God, what have I done? What have I said? Why did I offend her? What am I to do? What shall I tell her? Thought Kitty, and she stopped by the door. Varenka, her hat on, and the parasol in her hands, was sitting at the table, examining the spring that Kitty had broken. She raised her head. Varenka, forgive me. Forgive me, Kitty whispered, coming up to her. I didn't know what I was saying. I... I really didn't mean to upset you, Varenka said, smiling. Peace was made, but with the arrival of her father, that whole world in which Kitty had been living changed for her. She did not renounce all that she had learned, but she understood that she had deceived herself in thinking that she could be what she wished to be. It was as if she came to her senses. She felt all the difficulty of keeping herself without pretense and boastfulness on that level to which she had wished to rise. Besides, she felt all the weight of that world of grief, sickness, and dying people in which she had been living. The effort she had made to force herself to love, it seemed tormenting to her, and she wished all the sooner to go to the fresh air, to Russia, to Yergushevo, where, as she learned from a letter, her sister Dolly had already moved with the children. But her love for Varenka did not weaken. As she was saying goodbye, Kitty begged her to come and see them in Russia. I'll come when you get married, said Varenka. I'll never get married. Well, then I'll never come. Well, then I'll get married only for that. Watch out now. Remember your promise, said Kitty. The doctor's predictions came true. Kitty returned home to Russia cured. She was not as carefree and gay as before, but she was at peace. Her Moscow griefs became memories. If you enjoy this format, please leave a like and subscribe and return tomorrow for the next chapter.